The next effect we're going to cover uses a similar sprite setup, however I need to increase the simulation's overall level of control. I've opened up the file CH6 Tornado Final in the scenes directory of my Maya project. The animation's 90 frames long. If I play the final rendered element, you'll see there's a dust cloud forming at the base of the tornado. This example will show you how to work with a much more controlled simulation, where I can easily manipulate things like the height, width, distribution, and density of the effect through particle expressions. This scene differs from the previous example, the tire smoke, in that we need to keep the particles under control at all times, rather than emit them and let dynamic forces carry the sprites away. In a production environment, as an effect evolves, I usually find supervisors asking for very small, specific changes. As I get further along in the development pipeline, the changes usually get smaller and more specific. I've found that it's best if you can build master controls into your scene, letting you fine-tune them without disturbing other aspects of the simulation that the supervisor is already happy with. Take this dust cloud as an example. I'm controlling its shape not with fields, but with runtime expressions that tell the particles how high to go, how fast to spin, and when to get sucked up into the middle of the tornado. To achieve this effect, I start off with a simple revolved disk, which I've attached to the base of the tornado using an expression. This expression averages all the points at the base of the geometry into a single point, to which I've applied to the translation of a locator. I can now point constrain anything I want to this locator. This is a NURBS disk I created by revolving a three-span curve around the y-axis. I've point constrained this disk to the locator at the base of the tornado. I'll add a surface emitter to this disk and set its rate to 20. Note, however, when I'm in the Emit from Object option window, I have to make sure to turn on Need Parent UV. Turning this flag on passes each particle's birth position to the particle itself. I'll talk more about that later. Once the emitter has been created, I need to change the speed and normal speed both to zero, as I'm going to be controlling how the particle moves myself. I also need to make the disk a goal object for my particles. This will enable me to use the goal U and goal V per particle attributes later on in my runtime expression. If I play forward now, the particle's positions will be assigned to their corresponding goal CV on the disk. This isn't what I want. I want to maintain the random emission pattern generated by the surface emitter. I also need to stick the particle to that point permanently. I can do this using the particle's parent U and parent V attributes. Note, I can only use these attributes on a NURBS surface due to its predictable parameterization. These attributes were automatically added to my particle object when I created the surface emitter. They tell the particle where it was born in UV space on the disk. These attributes, however, are read-only, meaning I cannot set them in my runtime expression. In order to use parent U and V, I'm going to create two per particle attributes called goal U and goal V. The attributes goal U and V tell a particle exactly which location to go to on its goal object. So if we want to use the surface emitter's nice random emission pattern, we can assign the parent U of a particle to be its goal U and assign parent V to goal V. I'll also limit the particle's lifespan. We'll do this in the particle's creation expression. If I play the simulation now, I see the particles being emitted in their correct location. I don't want any particles being born inside the tornado, I just want to create a ring around the base. So rather than modify the geometry, I'm going to kill off any particles that were emitted within a certain distance to the center. First, I'll change the particle's lifespan mode to lifespan PP only, so we can kill off any particles we don't need. Then, I'll add this functionality to the creation expression. When I built my disk, I carefully noted its parameterization in both U and V. I know its U parameter goes from 0 to 1, so this line eliminates any particles whose U value is too low. I want to have control over how my particles are distributed around the disk. Despite the fact that they're pinned down where they were emitted, I can now use goal offset to modify their position. I want to start off by modifying only their X and Z position, as we'll be working with their height a bit later. I'm going to add a couple of lines to our creation expression. I'm using the Gauss, or Gaussian, function. This function describes a distribution curve that uses the first arguments as its mean value.
goal offset is a vector array, so I have to define it using vector syntax. I'm going to zero the particle's y value for now. Gaussian distribution is used frequently in physics and mathematics. It can be roughly defined as a bell-shaped distribution curve, which proves useful when you need control over the probability of a particle falling within certain parameters. The Gauss function will become more and more apparent when we add height to the cloud. For now, I've offset the particle's goal x and z values by what we'll call a random number. Now, let's add some height to the particle cloud by adding a y value to our goal offset. This float defines a distribution that's clamped at a minimum of zero, which means particles won't get offset underneath the disk to a randomized maximum value, which is also made positive with the absolute value function. The third argument generates the actual position of the particle, and the first two limit it to a certain amount. Note how the distribution falls off as the particle's y value increases. That's the Gaussian distribution in action. Now, I need to increase the height of the cloud, but I may want to change it over the entire animation. I'm going to add a non-per-particle attribute to the particle shape called cloud height. I'll use this value as a multiplier for the goal offset in the y-axis. I'll set this attribute to 2.5. Note this value is simply a multiplier. It will not limit the height of the cloud to 2.5 units. If I wanted, I could also create minimum and maximum height attributes, which I could hook into the creation expression. This technique is important because it brings control over your creation and runtime expressions to the surface, right into the channel box. Not everyone necessarily knows how to code creation expressions, and if this file were handed off to a junior animator, they need only adjust the attributes provided for them in the channel box. I want each particle in the dust cloud to form by rising from the disk into position. This means I can't set its goal offset in the creation expression, so I'm going to ramp it up in the runtime expression. First, I need to remember its goal offset, so I'll create an init goal offset attribute. I'll set the y value of goal offset to zero in the creation expression and assign the real value to init goal offset. Now I'll add functionality to slide the particles up in y after they're born in the runtime expression. First, I'll need to capture init goal offset as a vector so I can address each element separately. Now, I'll add a line to modify goal offset. This smooth step makes sure the particle's y value is fully ramped up by the time it's 15% of its lifespan. Next, I need to spin the particles around the surface of the disk. This can be easily done by modifying the goal v attribute with a multiplier, which I'll call goal v excel, which I'll define in the creation expression. Now that I've defined the multiplier, I'll modify goal v in the runtime expression by using a minus equals function. This will cause the particles to spin around the disk counterclockwise. If I wanted them to spin the other way, I'd use a plus equals function. I've defined goal v excel to be a very small number, so the particles are spinning around quite slowly. I'm going to add an attribute to the particle shape called dust spin. This will act as yet another multiplier to goal v. I could have made goal v excel a regular multiplier, but I wanted to assign each particle a random number. With dust spin, I can control the overall spin of the entire cloud and the speed at which each particle spins around the disk. I'll factor this multiplier into the entire goal v equation. Now I have my particles' rotational speed ramping in after they're born, so you see them slowly come to life. I've found that paying special attention to how particles are born and how they die is sometimes more important than what happens when they're flying around on the screen. Particles that pop on or off the screen draw the viewer's attention away from the overall effect.
There's two more things we need to do before moving on to render the dust cloud. We need to determine what happens when the particle dies or approaches the end of its lifespan. My reasoning is that as a particle grows older, it gets sucked closer and closer to the center of the twister, finally getting drawn up into it. In order to achieve that, I need to first slide the particle towards the center as it gets older. I'll do this in the runtime expression by modifying the goal u attribute. This line slides the particle from its predetermined goal u position back to zero where it's between 35 and 65 percent of its lifespan. Now the dust needs to get sucked up into the center of the twister. I could do this by adjusting the goal offset, but that would mean I'd have to determine how much to add to each particle's y value. I'm going to use a radial field with a negative magnitude so it attracts rather than repels the particles. These particles are still locked into position, however, and have been since birth. There's a built-in particle attribute called goal PP that was created automatically when I made a goal object out of the disk. Goal PP lets me change the strength of each particle's goal value. Up to this point, goal PP for all particles had been set to 1. In order for the particle to leave its position and get sucked up into the twister, I have to ramp down each particle's goal PP over time. I'll do this in the runtime expression. This ramps the goal PP from 1 down to 0, starting when the particles have reached half their lifespan. I'll add a radial field to the particles, set its magnitude to negative 100, and its attenuation to 2, so the field doesn't take effect too quickly. I'll position the field over the disk, but slide it up in Y to a height of about 70 units. This should draw the particles well out of the way of the camera's view. I'll parent this field under the same node that's point-constrained to the base of the tornado, so the particles always get sucked straight up in the y-axis. I can see these particles are going way up into the air. Remember, keeping the number of particles to a minimum helps keep your workflow fast. I'm going to add a line to the runtime expression to kill off any particles that are higher than a certain value. I'll also need to pull the particle's position into a vector so I can extract its y-value. My particles are now behaving as I want. Let's work on the look of the sprites now. I'll create a Lambert shader with the same cloud file texture setup as in Chapter 4. This sprite setup is almost identical to the tire smoke, except for some of the sprite scale values. As with the tire smoke, I've scaled the particle up from zero after it's born, as well as fade up its opacity from zero to its inid opacity value. There's a slight modification to the dust cloud particles that wasn't implemented in the tire smoke. In the creation expression, I've added a line that creates a relationship between the particle's goal offset in the y-axis and the size of the particle. In this example, I've modified the sprite scale based on the particle's y-position. This line takes any particle with a low goal offset in y, in this case less than 2, and scales it down to 60% of its original size. For a finishing touch to the dust cloud, I'd like to have smaller particles move faster. By reducing the size of low-lying particles and increasing the speed of those small particles, the bottom of the cloud will appear to spin faster than the rest of the cloud. To spin smaller particles faster, I'm going to make a modification to our goal v excel line in the creation expression. This line multiplies the goal v excel by the normalized scale of each particle. I've created a bit of a hack to determine the median of all the particles' scale, which turns out to be about 12.5. Therefore, average-sized particles don't have their speed changed much at all, while smaller particles have their speed increased and large particles have their speed decreased. Finally, I notice the particles are remaining a bit too opaque as they rise up into the core of the tornado. The last thing I want to add to my runtime expression before I render is a slight modification to the opacity. Here, I've determined the maximum height I want particles to be visible, which turns out to be 18 units in Y. I start the opacity reduction at 12 units. This gives the cloud a nice fade-off as they rise up into the twister, so that any particles that rise above 18 units are rendered with an opacity of zero. I'll hardware render this element using the same settings as in Chapter 5. I've turned up my hardware render motion blur setting to 1.25. 
This helps visually increase the speed of the dust element, as well as tie all the individual sprites into one cloud. Choosing the background color for this element can be tricky, as some fine detail can be lost over a black background. Rendering with a lighter background will help the elements stand out better in the composite. I've chosen a medium gray for this element using Hardware Alpha as my alpha source. This setting ensures the background of my alpha remains black. 